Hi, my name is uh, Marcus Ford. I'm a professor of urban informatics at QUT, Queensland University of Technology. I'm really pleased to be talking to you today about data care and how we are currently working on a new approach to participatory urban analytics for better decision making in smart cities. I'm also really um, grateful for uh, Marta to be asking me to speak um, to you at the Alta Scuola Politecnica and um, in doing so continuing our our partnership with the um, Politecnico di Torino. Um, we've had the pleasure of welcoming um, Marta here at QUT with uh, um, colleagues Professor um, Marco and we are also looking forward to further collaborations once um, the travel restrictions are, are lifted. What I've prepared here is an overview of um, who we are as a research group and then we'll go into um, the details around urban analytics and the development of how the smart city agenda has unfolded over the last couple of years. Urban Informatics for us is a um, research group that brings together the digital and the physical layers of cities and we um, do this um, in a very broad um, approach. So you can see here the timeline, there's a number of of these research centers that have emerged since 2012. Our approach, and we start in 2006, um, is a little bit broader. We are not just focusing on city analytics and the mathematics, if you'd like, of um, urban data, but we actually have this um, interdisciplinary uh, take that combines um, uh, social science, uh, spatial science, and a technical approach um, together in our research group. So there is influences from architecture and urban design and um, urban planning, but also uh, influences and methods used from the humanities, from uh, interaction design and human-computer interaction and other parts of um, technology. In this definition that we published at uh, CSCW in 2011, we say that urban informatics is the study, design, and practice of urban experiences across different urban contexts that are created um, by the new opportunities of real-time ubiquitous technology and the augmentation that mediates the physical and digital layers of people networks and urban infrastructures. You can see here that our um, research projects are also similarly um, broad and diverse. We do have projects that are focused on um, data analytics and, and data visualization. For instance, the one at the top there, the RAISE project that Marta um, helped us with is the Rapid Analytics Interactive Scenario Explorer and it allows for a rapid um, approach towards the calculation of value um, capture and value um, uplift scenarios. But we're also working across a number of other domains. So there is um, research projects that are focusing on sustainability, on mobility and transport. We've been doing a lot of community engagement work in the context of urban planning. Um, we've been looking at entrepreneurship and living labs and different ways of um, looking at um, innovation in the city. The lab is now um, part of a larger entity which is called the QUT Design Lab. So urban informatics as a group is now embedded in this entity that also brings together colleagues from um, robotics uh, and design robotics, uh, people from industrial design and fashion and communication design and other, other disciplines. What um, I will go through um, today is these three different um, phases of city development that I've um, called city 2.0, 3.0, and, and 4.0, and I'll focus on the um, specific um, idea of decision support and participatory um, city analytics um, as I um, go through these slides. So let's start with City 2.0, and actually it begs the question of where is, where is City 1.0? So City 1.0 in this kind of table that illustrates the relationship between a city government and um, the people living in cities at that level, it was a very kind of um, simple relationship, that of administrators of city infrastructure and the residents living in the city. And often here in Australia, um, the city government is sometimes referred to as looking after the three R's, which are the roads, rates, and rubbish. And I think a lot of city governments wanted to 
um, lift their game and consider themselves as the at a service provider. And then that actually changes the relationship of the people and the um, businesses um, operating in the city um, to the role of consumers, the consumers of city services. I'll play you this video that illustrates a little bit um, the, um, these early um, notions of the smart city. The time to make our city smarter is now. But how do you keep traffic flowing? Cure a healthcare system. Protect citizens while protecting their privacy. How do you show one decision affecting millions of people? Become a citizen of the smarter city. So this is a video by, by IBM. Um, both part of the, um, the Smarter Planet and the Smart City um, marketing that was launched around 2011, 2012. And you can see um, how the city is portrayed as um, a opportunity for optimization, for productivity gains, for efficiency gains. And also the view is usually from above. So you kind of look at it uh, in this top-down fashion. You can see the opportunities to use data feeds in order to um, drive optimization at that kind of level. And then the people operating both um, their, their lives, their jobs, their businesses, they um, become abstracted in this um, top-down notion of um, data analytics. Now, there were a number of technologies that were at the very early days of, um, of City 2.0 um, talked about and uh, invested in. One of them is free Wi-Fi. I think that was one of the pet projects across the world that a lot of cities that wanted to become a smart city, they started with offering free Wi-Fi. And so you know, this is one of the um, um, photos of uh, an announcement that free Wi-Fi is available here in the, um, in the Botanic Gardens and um, is made available for, for citizens to get online. Another project that has been part of the embrace of the smart city are smart street poles and, and lights. Uh, this one is a photo of Canada Bay, which is a suburb in Sydney. And you can see these um, new lights that have been installed that have various new functions and features. So they um, come with LED lights that can be programmed uh, in different colors and different light intensity. They're usually coupled with motion sensors. So as there is um, different people, um, for instance, walking underneath, the lights could increase in intensity um, and then uh, dim uh, afterwards in order to conserve energy. It usually is also possible to combine the light poles with other sensors, whether it is um, environmental sensors or whether it is um, other functionality like 5G or LoRaWAN um, kinds of beacons that provide connectivity. And they also have other kind of um, utility functions such as um, just set, set of PowerPoints that are available at the base level so that if there is, for instance, um, farmers markets or other kinds of events happening at the ground level that um, the operators can plug into a PowerPoint and get um, electricity from these different locations. Another um, interesting uh, investment proposition for the smart city has been um, the idea of urban screens and public displays. This photo here shows a screen that's been installed at King George Square, which is one of our main squares in Brisbane. And um, I think what uh, is part of the rationale for the investment in such sc screens is the, the tangible um, kind of infrastructure. So the smart city usually is all about digital technology. And what city officials wanted is there to be more tangible representations of this digital nature. And so an urban screen like this um, is something that people can point the finger at and you can see there it is. This is a, a tangible evidence that we've now become a digital city or a smart city. The problem with these screens though is that uh, oftentimes they don't um, come with the same level of investment for a curatorial team to actually be looking after the programming and the content curation. And so as a result, often you get free-to-air television programs or sport programs that display uh, are displayed and broadcast on these screens. 
And it actually begs the question whether there is a relationship between the location of where this screen is uh, situated and the content that is displayed. Is it becoming more than just a big TV screen or is it um, just simply there to display advertisement and free-to-air television? The other part to the early days of the smart city is investment in data and data feeds. The three main categories are around open data and government data in general that becomes increasingly available um, in order to run analytics on. The second category is around social and, and personal uh, data, so whether it is um, social media or whether it is um, um, feeds from our use of um, electronic um, transport cards, um, looking at credit card transactions, looking at the personal transactions that we engage with on a daily to day basis. And the third category is around IoT, Internet of Things, devices, sensors uh, and sensor networks that are producing data in their own right. And so these three data sets and categories of data are all coming together and uh, afford opportunities for city analytics. Now this data has to go somewhere. Um, oftentimes the uh, term the cloud is now being used to describe that it sits there in an accessible manner um, up there in, uh, in the cloud. And cloud computing is one of the main cornerstones of, um, of the smart city uh, and the technology layer of the smart city. What um, we feel is, is problematic with this very technocratic and, and technology-centric approach to the smart city is that it often doesn't pay much attention to um, unpacking and really um, having a thorough understanding of what the problems are. So if you have a congestion and you have a problem with, with traffic and mobility, this is like this kind of idea of an engineering and technology-driven approach to fixing this problem. And oftentimes this can um, be problematic because it may just shift the problem elsewhere. If we, for instance, think of the smart city as a solution to sustainability, what has become interesting is that oftentimes um, the investment in IoT devices, in the data being generated that requires electricity, the devices themselves, they often contain rare earth metals that need to be mined somewhere. Um, and because of planned obsolescence, they also need to be replaced a lot of the time. And then it uh, generates and um, produces more and more e-waste that also then has to be um, um, moved somewhere. What we actually find overall, if we have a much bigger perspective, is that whilst there is certain sustainability gains in the city, overall it shifts the sustainability problem to locations out of view and out of sight. And so from a planetary perspective, the smart city doesn't actually um, create as many benefits for sustainability as what it currently portrays to be. One of the um, pictures that has been used a lot in the early days of the smart city is this idea of the control room. This one here is the IBM control room in Rio de Janeiro that was installed in, I believe, 2012. And the idea is that all the data feeds been, um, the data feeds generated from these IoT devices, from our own transactions in the city, they come together to then enable um, efficiencies and, and optimizations to be derived for a better management of city services. What we find is that um, uh, the idea of city analytics could also derive a lot of benefits for businesses and for citizens and community groups. And that is what um, I want to, to focus on in, um, in the um, slides to come. I mentioned the open and agile smart cities network here because in addition to this push from um, smart city technology providers and different platform operators, there's also been a, um, a movement that is led by cities themselves. So different city governments have now started to come together and they've recognized some of the risks and some of the problems with this embrace of technology in, in cities. And one of the big problems is what's called vendor lock-in, which means that a certain vendor is using um, proprietary software and proprietary technology that then means only their products can be used in that city and it doesn't work well with others. And so as a result, cities that have come together in this 
community of practice, if you'd like, of um, the Open and Agile Smart Cities Network. They are subscribed to these four principles. Um, three of them are about open standards, um, which is that there should be a common API. The um, data should be stored on an openly accessible platform and the models used to describe the data are also standardized. And then the fourth principle is to be driven by implementation, which means that this is supposed to be demonstrated um, by actual projects on the ground that are then enacting these three technical um, um, principles of um, openness. There's a number of cities that have um, signed up to the OASC, including cities in Italy. Um, we've brought the um, OASC to Australia in 2015. There is a number of cities in um, South America. There is a memorandum of understanding with cities in the US. And I think the latest map um, is actually also reaching out to cities in, in Asia. So this first phase of uh, City 2.0, uh, so the first phase of the smart city, I should say, um, had an emphasis on, on open data and data as uh, the new gold, as it was called. Um, but very quickly, um, it was also um, um, found and recognized that we have to embrace standards and open standards in order to make um, these different pieces of investment work uh, in, in order to um, achieve interoperability. So now as I'm going into the next um, phase or level, the city 3.0, what is changing here is that the city is actually turning um, more into a facilitator rather than just a service provider. And the um, people, businesses and community groups in the city um, can participate in city making. Uh, this is something that I've um, written up in this um, article in response to when Australia first launched its national um, smart city plan. And um, even at that time, uh, it, was, it was quite crucial to point out that um, a lot of the uh, policy rhetoric and the wording was still very technocratic. It was talking about finance and investment, and it was losing focus on the actual um, purpose, which was to be much more human-centered in order to bring about an um, environment uh, of the city that is about being more livable um, and more sustainable and more equitable. When we um, kind of compare this now with, uh, again, this idea of the control room, what would it look like to have this control room under this um, rubric of, of City 3.0 and for it to be more participatory? Well, um, we were inspired by an investment here at QUT into this visualization space that's called the Cube. Um, and you can see here there is a number of people assembled down there. It's open and accessible. It has um, similarly, large screen real estate and different interactive um, touch screens at the bottom there. But um, what is interesting is this ability for different <coughs> groups to come together and to actually use this space for their own data analytics. So this is this notion of participatory data analytics that we are um, talking about here. So what could this look like? We've been um, engaged in a um, experiment as a kind of proof of concept with um, food trucks, um, just as an as an example. And so these these food trucks they use a commercial kitchen in Brisbane um, where they come together in an afternoon to prepare their food, and then they stock up the truck, and then in the evening they go out and um, start selling the food. So what we've been doing here is we've um, been dragging across the river some of our equipment. You can see here these. Um, computers on wheels, they are called, um, and we've um, set them up at the spot where a lot of the food trucks um, come together. And we've ran different uh, city analytics uh, inquiries with them. So in this kind of, you know, as I said, participatory manner. One of the uh, mashups that we've created was to enable them to be more strategic about their um, deployment. So you can see here the different cuisines represented, obviously Italian being one of the favorite cuisines. We wanted to make sure that the same cuisine of food truck is not actually creating their own competition in the same area. So they spread themselves out and make sure that um, there is a diversity of different offerings and they don't, um, by um, serendipity or um, coincidence, 
um, set up the same uh, cuisine in the same suburb or neighborhood. So this would enable them just to be more strategic in their placement. And then we've extended this to also look at different data mashups. So we've been, for instance, interested in uh, crowding and how there is data about music events, sports events, um, soccer, rugby, and so forth. And at what time there would be masses of people that are coming together in the city and being able to then locate food trucks nearby where there is lots of um, potential customers. Similarly, um, postgraduate students that are um, finishing their, their classes after hours, it might be six or seven o'clock in the evening. And at that time, a lot of the retailers on campus would already be closed. And so that usually then means that there's only, you know, food available and vending machines, or maybe they can heat something up in a microwave um, on campus, but it's not ideal. So we've also been interested in how food trucks could be co-located at the same time as these um, postgraduate classes finish after hours. And the third example was around construction sites. So we were also interested in how construction workers on building sites, um, which is actually during the day, um, and they're often catered by uh, very basic kind of, you know, sausage rolls and, and meat pies, um, that food trucks could actually think of a different time of the day to be operating um, for this kind of audience of um, consumers. And so this is just an example of how um, city analytics can actually be brought to citizens and small businesses. Um, there's another element to it that I didn't discuss today around procurement, because it actually also can be extended to a more participatory approach um, for the city's procurement process that is um, based on a uh, notion and uh, embrace of principles of, of open innovation. So then the, um, the next level um, is actually taking this even further. And so here we have a uh, change in the relationship that is much more on a par between the city government and um, the um, people living in the city and the businesses operating in the city, um, between the city government as collaborator and the other stakeholders as co-creators of city futures. Now this also resonates with a number of other things. This one here is um, a cover of Time magazine in 2006. Um, at that time, the person of the year um, that was nominated, uh, was, was, was um, highlighted, was you to symbolize the participatory nature of the internet. So this is around the time of the early days of Web 2.0 and the um, ways the internet became much more accessible um, through um, different um, technologies. What I think is really interesting now is how some of this can be reframed to this collective we. So rather than having this notion of networked individualism that is about the individual participating, we can actually now look at a lot of um, the different approaches and mechanisms to embrace a collective and co-creative approach, um, especially in the smart city. This also dovetails really nicely with this um, notion of the IAP2 spectrum of public participation. Uh, IAP2 stands for the International Association for Public Participation. And you can see they understand or they distinguish between these different, um, I suppose, levels or qualities of engagement. So there is um, a very basic um, informing and consulting phase. But if you actually take um, the expectation further, you want to be involving people and you want to enable um, collaboration between them and eventually you want to reach this level of empowerment. And so our question from a research point of view is how do we reach empowerment status when it comes to smart cities and city analytics? Um, in order to, to understand this research question, we've been reviewing a number of urban innovation hubs in, um, in the world and Oftentimes, they have these four ingredients and they subscribe what is referred to as a um, quadruple helix innovation model. And so the quadruple means four, and the four elements are academia, business, government, and civil society. And they come together in different combinations. This is work that um, one of our PhD students who's um, recently graduated, uh, Dr. Irina Anastasio, has been um, working on. Uh, she's, by the way, working now um, closer to Italy in, in Munich, in the south of Germany, working for the city of Munich. 
and um, applying some of her research um, down there. The, these different innovation models that we've been looking at, um, one of them here is um, the Urban Innovation Center in London. We've been looking at the one in Barcelona, and I will talk about Barcelona in a second a little bit more. Um, this one here is called the Urban Laboratory. Um, we were interested in the new urban mechanics um, approach in Boston in the US, as well as the um, City Studio Vancouver uh, in Canada, which is a collaboration also with the University of British Columbia and Simon Fraser University. What we found by looking and reviewing these different um, innovation labs is that they combine elements from these different uh, domains. So oftentimes there is an element of entrepreneurship, startup culture and incubation spaces. Oftentimes there's also an element of cool working spaces or maker spaces to be able to, to prototype or to tinker and, and fabricate materials. There's another um, element around data. And then there's also resources that um, come from either libraries or from the universities. And in different combinations, these urban innovation hubs bring them together to form an ecosystem. And sometimes this ecosystem is distributed, so it doesn't necessarily operate just in one central location. This article um, brings some of our thinking together. It actually is a comparison between the um, sidewalk labs development in Toronto at the waterfront that recently was abandoned by, by Alphabet company, the Google um, holding company. And we compared the um, sidewalk labs um, development in Canada with the case of Barcelona and especially their notion of technological sovereignty and data sovereignty. And so what we found in this article is not just the kind of criticism of a very corporate approach to the smart city, that has um, potential risks for um, privacy and autonomy, it also had a particular um, challenge for sovereignty. So a city uh, and the city governance is based on a notion of sovereignty that it can make its own decisions about how it wants to run things. Now, when some of the decision making is based on data and the data is then um, owned um, and stored on infrastructure, that is um, in, uh, in corporate ownership, that can have a risk of jeopardizing the ability for a city to remain in, um, sovereign and to have civic sovereignty over its um, uh, governance. So in addition to privacy and in addition to um, data ethics concerns, the idea of technological sovereignty and data sovereignty is now also emerging as a um, crucial um, uh, litmus test for whether smart cities are actually really in pursuit of uh, uh, bringing about more equitable futures and more ethical ways of dealing with city analytics and, and decision making. So on the basis of this review between um, the case in Canada and the case in um, Barcelona, we've been trying to identify what's our vision for how this might operate um, here in Australia. And so this vision is what we call data care. And data care is at the moment a proposal for a dedicated facility that is offered by the city to citizens, communities and businesses. The idea behind it and the main goal is to renew the social license to operate smart cities. And it's about a dedicated space and so what I'm going to talk to you about is some of the kinds of configurations of that space. So far we've been um, thinking of four different um, configurations. The first one is very straightforward. This is where the space is configured as a, uh, as a clinic. So it's actually about some sort of um, notion of triage where individuals, community groups come in and they get paired up with individual um, support and uh, the idea or the purpose here is to raise awareness around um, what the opportunities as well as the challenges are when it comes to um, data and data analytics. In the second configuration, the one that we call the classroom, um, the purpose here is to lift levels of data literacy. This is slightly different to media or digital or um, technological literacy. Data literacy is also about being aware of the consequences from a, from a privacy or ethical point of view. 
both when it comes to um, releasing data. So when you, for instance, click accept on terms and conditions that are presented to you when you sign up to a new um, app or a new service, but also when it comes to the kinds of data analytics that um, is run. The third configuration is what we call the um, data care lab, and that allows the space to be hired or leased by um, groups of people, by small medium enterprises, so that um, this idea of the control room is all of a sudden in the hands of um, people themselves. So the food truck example is, I think, a good um, way of illustrating what this um, third configuration could look like, which is where data analytics is given and the power of data analytics is given uh, into the hands of um, SMEs, community groups and, and citizens. The fourth configuration, the data futures scenario, is where the um, data care space is configured as a studio. So we are using here speculative design methods and speculative design scenarios in order to understand an entire spectrum of possibilities when it comes to smart city investment. So rather relying on just the one scenario that a vendor might create, which is usually very positive, everything goes well, there's no problems, the sky is blue, um, you might actually want to um, consider and anticipate some of the other possibilities, whether they are good or bad, so that there's a spectrum from utopia to dystopia, and that is important to be ready when it comes to the policy and a regulatory environment that needs to be created for smart city technology to be um, leading to desirable futures. So rather than leaving this up to chance, the, um, the data futures configuration is about using the facility as a speculative and anticipatory space that uses um, futuring methods to come up with a range of scenarios so that um, policymakers can be better prepared um, for understanding the consequences of investing in smart city technology. We've written up um, this work in, uh, in this book chapter that you are able to download from that, um, from that web link and it will go into a new book um, coming out on automating cities, the design, construction, operation and future impact. We are currently working with um, a um, partner, a funding body called Frontier SI that we've been working with um, for a while on this research and they are a um, research and development um, company that is investing in um, spatial data and, uh, and data analytics. Um, there is a, a number of investments and research projects in the notions of um, digital twins. And we are now looking at um, working and collaborating with Frontier SI to make the data care vision come reality. The other partner on board is the Smart Cities Council. We have here the um, branch for Australia, New Zealand, Smart Cities Council, um, Australia, New Zealand. They have recently launched a new initiative that's called the Center for Data Leadership. And this center has proposed the data leadership vitals. So these vitals are kind of like um, five different um, uh, tests that uh, need to be applied in order to make sure that the data collection and data analytics for decision making is um, ethical. Ethical, I suppose, is the overarching one. It's listed there as one of the vitals. In addition to that, there needs to be um, also um, uh, attention paid on purpose, on privacy, security, and governance. What we are now wanting to do with the data care facility is to actually translate some of these aspirations and some of these um, principles into, into action. So what does it actually mean to be um, um, pioneering or championing um, data leadership um, with these five um, values at um, the helm of the, uh, of the initiative? So what would it mean to be um, uh, installing and, and operating with privacy by design, for instance, as one of the um, uh, design um, principles. So this phase um, of um, 
uh, data care that we are currently working on is really um, the main um, focus of our work at the moment. With um, these other partners, we are looking at what will it mean um, for the city, how can it be deployed and installed, what would the engagement program look like, what would the literacy programs look like, in order to then um, really unpack and understand this notion of data leadership. And that in turn is embedded in um, a, a wider, I suppose, um, subscription to the notion of citizen co-creation, where the citizens are not just consumers, that the city is um, um, uh, servicing with, um, with their uh, infrastructure and, and provisions of city services, but it's a much more active relationship between the city or the municipality as the ones governing the city and allowing for um, a more democratic, I suppose, um, cool ownership of um, city futures. If you got any questions, I'd be very interested to, to hear from you. It would have been great to actually be there in person to, to answer your questions, but um, in the absence of that, um, feel free to, to drop me an email um, at the address provided. Um, I'll also uh, share not just the video, but the slides themselves with you so that you can um, copy uh, some of the um, references and the um, the links that I've um, put onto the slides here. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from you and see how this might resonate with what is happening um, there in Italy. So with that, I'll um, thank you very much and uh, I'll hope to hear from you.